What I want to talk about today is the 21st century human. This is a different human than existed 100 years ago in terms of our health. When you consider how far the advancement is of living today in 2017 compared to where my grandfather landed in Canada in 1917. And he lived strong and healthy until he was 96 years old without any modern conveniences until probably the late 1940s. Um, you know, when he was my age, when he was in his 50s. Uh, pretty extraordinary. Healthy people, healthy times. My parents are 85 years old and going strong. Um, but uh, what I call Homo sapiens toxicanus, the sub um, group of Homo sapiens, is now basically sick from head to toe. That's why organizations like uh, Vitality Magazine are putting on things like the Whole Life Expo because people are seeking alternatives because we haven't been able to figure out how to cure all this stuff. It just keeps getting worse and worse and worse across society. So, you know, people are having problems, literally brain problems, right down to muscle problems in your feet and everywhere in between. So it's interesting to note what we're made of. Humans are made 99% of these six elements, carbon, oxygen, calcium, nitrogen, hydrogen, and phosphorus. 99% of our body are these six elemental things. These are universal elements. They're found throughout the universe. They're found on the moon. They're found in, 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 uh, in, on Earth and all the planets. Uh, you know, they, meteorites crash the ground and they find this stuff. But the majority of us is made up of only two of those elements hydrogen and oxygen together as water. 60% to 80% of every person is actually water. Only 1% of us is these other 51 things. So six things make up 99% of us and 51 things make up that 1%. Now isn't that very interesting that they, they, in all people these other 51 things exist. So the ones that I've highlighted in yellow are the ones that you might have heard about maybe at the naturopath. You're high in lead, you're high in cadmium, arsenic, nickel, mercury. These are elevated things in people right now. It's a very delicate balance when one of these falls out of whack and comes to rep So in 51 things, if that's 1%, then decimal 0.5% is, if they were equal, would be all of these. So imagine a slight abnormality in any one of these things causes upset in your health. And the elements on the rise, so if you look at this, in the, uh, in the blue, which is the smallest one at the bottom left, represents the levels across the human spectrum in 1970, around the time I was about five years old. So we had about one part per million in mercury, we had about 1.5 in lead and cadmium, we had about a half a part per, per billion of nickel. And this would have been considered not super healthy, but average. So fast forward to the yellow, 1990, 20 years later. And now the average is two and a half parts per billion mercury, three parts per billion lead, four parts per billion cadmium, uh, almost two parts per billion in nickel. So this is now becoming average. And when you think about 1990, this is sort of around the time that the terms the yuppie flu were coming out. For We don't know why you're sick, we're calling it this. Fibromyalgia was with the early days of people hearing this, this word or thinking about this word. Sir, if you don't mind not filming, that would be really awesome. I find it terribly distracting. And for everyone else, just please don't photograph or film. Thanks so much. Um, so uh, as we move forward another 20 years, closer to now, 2010, look at how high those are. Five parts per billion mercury, lead, cadmium, nickel. They're all about the same. And this is getting way out of whack. And this is because if you look at the, the graphs to show the, the, the world extraction of this stuff, it matches this. So we're mining more of this stuff. It's getting out and it's being used. It's in the air, like globally. What's happening to the earth by pulling this stuff out of the ground and putting it in the environment, it's getting into us. It makes sense. We understand a lot more today about the biosphere of the planet as it relates to the biosphere of the person than we did in 1990. But so it makes sense that the more we mine, the more we pull out, the more we're going to get inside of us. And we're drinking it. Okay, this is, looks to me like iron rich water. It might be chemical. I just pulled this photo off, but it's, it looks to be iron rich. So we're putting this stuff in our water and we're drinking it. Let's not forget, what are we, the majority? Water. 
So we become this. And if we become this, we're out of whack. And if we're out of whack, we get what we have in society today with all this illness. A polluted water becomes a polluted people. This is a, a Hindu going through a morning ritual and this is what this person can find for water to dip in. They go five times, they dunk uh, and when they pray in the morning and they got to do it. It's what they were taught, it's the religion, they believe in it. And when you think about it, if we're water, why not submerse ourselves in water, right? So it has a wisdom that is uh, probably uh, in conjunction with the spiritual right, the religious right that it's part of. But look at this thing from water. So that is a fish. You see these pictures from time to time with a canker or a, a cancer tumor on its, uh, on its lower lip. Um, but more importantly, close to 100% of the male bass fish were laying eggs. The boys were laying eggs in the U.S. Northeast in 2004. Close to 100%. All of the fish were hermaphrodite. And this is due to the chemicals in the water which we drink. And if you think your water only comes from the tap, it doesn't. It comes from this lake. It comes from that lake out there where all of our stuff goes. That's where our water comes from. So that's what we're, we are, Lake Ontario, quite, quite literally. So 21st century Canadian fish. That was a, a report out of the U.S. Uh, northeast, which isn't too far from us, from 10 years ago. This one is from um, just a couple years ago. So the Grand River, which flows through Waterloo, Ontario, at the sewage treatment plant, the male fish were found to be also be laying eggs. So this is such a profound disruption in this species that lives in water that it is no longer capable of determining what gender it is. And if you see any of that happening in the human race now, it was predicted 20 years ago that we're going to start to see a lot more gender flu fluidity in the human race. This, is, this was predicted when they started finding hermaphrodite uh, crocodiles in the Florida swamps because they live in water and they live a long time and they're big, like us. So plastic becomes like estrogen. So plastic in the water becomes something we drink and this is an example of somebody with makeup, hair color, I mean this is a cartoonish example but we see makeup, we see hair color, we see our kids are wearing this stuff and they're putting it right on their skin and it goes in. It doesn't stay out. It's not like a, a, an impervious hide. It is a conduit to our bloodstream. So you can put many types of poison on your skin, on your bloodstream. In this case directly into the lymphatic system. So for decades, nobody, we trusted this stuff. We had to wear underarm deodorant. I haven't worn this stuff in my adult life, and I lived in India. You know, it just, it never, I, I wash in the morning, I keep cool, and I don't, I don't think I stink. I mean, I, you know, I mean, sometimes you're working out, you go, oh, yeah, yeah, you gotta have a shower. But generally speaking, it's, it's, it's a really an unnecessary product. And then we found out it was full of aluminum, right? And we were putting that right on there. And what do we have during that arc of time? We had all kinds of women getting endometriosis, getting all, and the women were affected. And I know because I have a sauna booth where the saunas are hot, and invariably people are coming and saying, I'm freezing, can I get in there? And 100% of the time, it's a 25-year-old woman. Should be in the prime of her life, in the healthiest position she can ever be in, and she's freezing because her body temperature is low, and maybe because you know, there was some no control on what she put on her skin. So these things are called endocrine disruptors, these, these the plasticizers, the phthalates, the, the things that are in the plastics, the things that are in the makeup. And they can cause cancer, thyroid disruption, and autoimmune disorders. We've only had the phrase endocrine disruptor since 1991. It was at the Wingspread Conference of Scientists, where, so that's going, um, well, that's less than, uh, it's about 25 years, 25, 26 years, we've had this idea that these things are a combined, the combined problem is they all do the same thing, they disrupt the endocrine system. So when you think of endocrine disruptors, they basically, your body thinks it's estrogen. So uh, makeup, something you put on your armpit, uh, water that you drink from a plastic bottle, your body confuses it with estrogen and your body acts like it's estrogen. So it, 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 um, it does things like elevated estrogen levels give you breast cancer, so it might think you've got too much elevated estrogen. But when you wonder how much estrogen is too much, I put out this photograph of a crowd at a, town, at a, at a city square 
estimating it to be about 200,000 people. So if you could isolate the estrogen from 200,000 women, and if you could show it in a vessel, what type of vessel, how big a cauldron would this be of the powerful estrogen hormone from 200,000 women? It fits in a teaspoon. This is one of the most powerful things on earth is the tiny, and I have estrogen in me, naturally, but the tiny imbalance between your estrogen and my estrogen makes you a woman and makes me a man. Tiny, 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 and that's for 200,000 women. So now consider plastic bottles, drinking it all the time, right? Consider all the other things, the plasticizers that are in uh, soap, that are in chewing gum, that are in all this stuff that we're eating every day. And of course, it's disrupting our health balance. We have a plastic planet. We have a plastic island in the North Pacific the size of Texas, okay, from garbage. So this planet and us are kind of the same thing right now. We're getting choked by this stuff. So in the 21st century, the human that is sick from head to toe has diabetes, arthritis, fibromyalgia, asthma, high blood pressure, chronic fatigue syndrome, psoriasis, heart disease, chronic obstructed pulmonary disorder, COPD. Now, I would say that in my family, I started to hear the words diabetes, arthritis, that's about it, maybe heart disease, in my grandparents as they started to age through their 60s and 70s. These words started coming into my household. So, right? Children have this stuff now in the 21st century. In Canada, there, oh, sorry, let me go back to that. Okay, sorry. The Canadian blood study that was done in 2007, so 10 years ago, showed 42 toxic chemicals in Canadian blood samples. And this was done by the uh, Environmental Defense Group, which is a volunteer organization, it's a charitable trust. And they, um, they did stuff like they took uh, all three uh, parliamentary leaders at the time, so Stephen Harper and Jack Layton, and I think Stephen Dion all got their blood taken, as well as a bunch of other people. And they showed that these guys had 42 toxic chemicals that were found in their blood, right? Unfortunately, Leighton didn't, uh, didn't last long after that, but it's not uncommon. The other ones had it too. They're still alive. Who gets sick? Who doesn't? An American study in 2007, the same year, found 113 chemicals in human blood. Now, it doesn't really mean that the, the Americans are that much more toxic than us. They may have looked for different things and found more of them. But just to say that there are 40, 50, 100 chemicals in our bloodstream, that's current exposure because your bloodstream moves it out into the fat cells and into the bone and into the muscle to get it out. It metabolizes it to, to the degree that it can to get it out of the bloodstream and its infinite wisdom so that it's not affecting the organs. And um, so that takes usually about two to three weeks to get that stuff out of the bloodstream. So this is a current exposure. So those 113 chemicals were within the last few weeks. So that could be you wash your hair and you've got sodium lauryl sulfate in your bloodstream in 15 minutes. Has anybody ever read uh, Slow Death by Rubber Duck, this book? Very interesting book. I recommend you look at it. These two environmental um, activists and uh, uh, careerists decided to lock themselves in their condo for a month and do commit the atrocities on their body. They'd wash their hair and then they'd test for their blood chemicals. They'd order a pizza and then they'd find the, the perfluorochlorine uh, uh, stuff from the uh, anti-stick, no, sort of the anti-saturant um, on the pizza box. They'd find it in their bloodstream. Uh, they'd they'd um, clean the carpets and they'd do a lead blood test. And, uh, and they wrote a book about it. They said, this is directly related. So in the 21st century, the toxic bloodstream has hundreds of metals and chemicals. This is the mother of all studies. This is from 2010. So based on these guys from Environmental Defense and the guys who wrote Slow Death by Rubber Duck, goading the Canadian government, Statistics Canada agreed to take 5,000 Canadian blood samples. And they can do this just by going to uh, blood labs and asking for them. They don't need human participants. So it was 5,000 people. That's a big study. To get a drug approved, you can get through with a couple of trials of 30, right? This is a big study. Um, so they found 14 organochlorines, chloridine, DDT, uh, 24 different types of PCBs, P3, 
PBDEs, these are flame retardants. These are carcinogenic, and they're in everything from this carpet to my computer to my bed, not my bed, but most beds. Um, I buy a Canadian-made bed out of rubber specifically because it doesn't have this stuff. Um, it's called Sleep Tech in Ottawa. Um, and uh, car seats, baby seats, um, sofas, it all has these, these flame retardants. So of course we all have them. Bisphenol A, a known carcinogen, plastic hardener, pesticides, chlorophenols. This is what they found in Canadians. And you test 5,000 Canadians and you find this stuff, it's in all of us and in this room right now, all this stuff. So it's also in the babies. Because if it's in the mother, guess what? So it all goes into the babies. There was a test done in 2007 in both US and Canada by the US Environmental Working Group. And they tested for 300 toxic chemicals. And they found 232 of them in the cord blood of the umbilicals of newborn babies. That included Teflon, rocket fuel, Scotchgard. This was in the mother. So it's in the baby. So we're born toxic now. So Homo sapiens toxicanus is now suffering what I think are the three primary failings of the species, which is neurotoxicity, brain problems, brain dysfunction, dementia, any of the Alzheimer's, or sorry, any of the autism spectrums. This is brain damage, right? So you go from um, Dyslexia and aphasia, which are uh, non-autism related learning disorders, which are permeating our schools right now. I have children that are going through the school system. I see this all around. Um, and the autism spectrum, where you take an otherwise uh, average to normal intelligent child and you put on a severe shyness. They can't put clothes on. They don't know how to process irony. Joke, they don't get jokes. They, don't, they, they look at the ground. Uh, they're, uh, they don't care about their looks, they're disheveled. This is a type of, of the autism spectrum. This is neurotoxicity. This is from the toxic mother to the child. <clears throat> and then developmental uh, toxicity, which would also be in that realm with the children, and of course cancer, which is the scourge of the human population today. So homeostasis is a phrase that I learn at medical conferences, which means the normal state of health. And if you look at the normal state of health of an individual, that would be homeostasis. But as a society now, our homeostasis is disease-ridden because we have an epidemic that's now been called a pandemic of diabetes. A pandemic simply means you, an epidemic is defined as uh, increasing at a certain rate. And a pandemic is when you have multiple clusters across the continent or a larger group, even the world, uh, of epidemics. So we have a pandemic of diabetes right now. Uh, type 2 diabetes, the adult onset diabetes that used to be my grandmother and now it's the 14 year olds. Cancer is rising at 2% a year steadily to the point where it's now half of the human population will get cancer. The other half of us are going to die of something else. But we're not going to get cancer. And multiple sclerosis has doubled since 2002. A huge part of this has been predicted to be Lyme disease misdiagnosed as the neurological breakdown that is then confused as multiple sclerosis because it fits the same, the same symptomology. Heart disease is a 20% rise in the last 17 years. Fibromyalgia is doubling. Something that nobody heard of 30 years ago is doubling. That's extraordinary. <clears throat> the 21st century babies with autism. So if you go back to 1985, the average was four and a half births per 10,000 were autistic births. If you go back to 1966, when I was born, it's one in 10,000. So in that 20 years, it increases fourfold. In the next 15 years to 2010, it goes up 20 times, up to 110,000. In the next five years, it goes up two and a half times more to 250 and 10,000. That's one in 40 male births is an autistic child today, coming out of the hospitals, in the spectrum that's been diagnosed or, or been defined. We have new ways to die in the 21st century. Non-alcoholic fatty littered liver disease, that's not a short form for Newfoundland. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In the 21st, 20th century, only alcoholics got it. Never did any, it was always an alcoholic's disease. It was the bulbous nose guy on the street who drank too much every day and couldn't stop, got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So, or sorry, uh, was, was, fatty liver disease was an alcoholic disease. But now, 
it's the fastest rising cause of liver transplants. We are eating, we are not processing fat. Our body is so screwed up with chemical and the crappy food we're eating that we're not processing fat and our liver is becoming fat toxic. And it's not like a little chunk you can cut off, it's intercellular. And th the biggest problem that this is the fastest rising cause of liver transplant, which, you know, um, juvenile liver failure, um, alcoholic liver failure, uh, you know, Steve Jobs liver failure the most toxic job on earth, being around constant new computers with all that stuff and his whole life. I mean, he had nothing in his house, but he was constantly at work with all the new product all the time, all the time, all the time. Uh, it's not surprising, you know, that a guy like that became very toxic and had a liver transplant and passed away. But the biggest problem now is that the liver donor, so a liver donor is somebody who's died suddenly in an accident normally. They can't use the livers because they're fatty when they get them. So this is going on right now in our world. It appears to me that the 21st century human is packing up. That we've got so much disease, it's all arcing upward. The diabetes, the chronic fatigue, the fiber, it's all arcing. If you look at the graphs, upward, 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 upward. Our body temperature is no longer 98.6. It's been recalibrated to 98.2. So that's about a half a degree down. Now, it was, nobody's was ever 98.6. It's an average from 99, 100, 98, but it's all coming down. Because in the toxicants get into the mitochondria, the little building blocks of oxygen, and they become sluggish. They don't move as fast. Like, our body is alive and moving and shaking and doing stuff. And these things can't move as well when they're laden with the heavy weight of mercury and lead in them. So what you're finding is that the body temperature can't stay up. It's a lot of work to keep the body temperature up. Girls are reaching puberty now about four years younger on average. That's dramatic. So if you go back, there was the big study. This hasn't been studied in large numbers for a long time. The 1800s was the first time. There was a big study of 10,000 um, uh, women in 1900. And they showed that um, the, uh, the first uh, menstruation was 14 years old. So that was the average. So the study was done again almost 30 years later, found the same results. 14 years old. It's actually, I think, 13.9, something like that. So the next big study, there was a 20-year study that ended in 1985, found that it was calibrated one year lower. So that was a surprising thing to have it one year lower because that's, it's, it, you say, well, that's a year, you know, but it's a 20-year study with many, 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 many people. And the average dropping down a year is as significant as the global temperature averaging down a year, down at a one degree, you know, or a small percentage. So then you fast forward 20 years after that, and it's gone down to 10 years old on average. So girls are getting their periods when they're 8, 9, 10, 11 years old now, commonly. As young as 8 in the African-American kids. Now, typically in the United States, much less so in Canada, they have segregated neighborhoods, segregated living, and the toxic worst plants and the worst real estate is the African-American um, population, which is the biggest minority in the United States. In Canada, you would probably say the native reserves or the native areas, um, you know, that are in Sarnia, Windsor, this area would be, you know, our version of that. Um, the blood texture, this is very interesting. A guy named Stephen Sinatra who lectured on this stage a few years ago. We, we invited him in to talk about electromagnetic field and Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation. Um, he pointed out that in the 1900s, so you go back 100 years, Human blood was thin like red wine. And this is a guy who describes human blood by saying, when I cut into a heart, it shoots across the room. He's a, he's a cardiologist. He's a surgeon, right? He says, now it just drips, drips, drips on the operating table. It's thick like ketchup. And that's because it's got low oxygen, it's coagulated, and it's got something, if you look at it under a live cell microscope, it's called Rouleau formation. So your red blood cells should be moving around like this, and they're, instead they're doing this. And that's why you feel a little bit tired in the afternoon, right? It's because our blood is not as thin and flowing as it was. This is a different human I'm describing. We are operating differently at a, bi a biological, molecular level than we did 100 years ago. I remember when my grandfather told me when I was smoking, when I was about 16, and I, I said, that's a little hypocritical, Gramps. You smoked till you were 90. He said, yeah, but there was no pollution on this farm. I went, oh, yeah, okay, fuck. He was right. And that was a comedy made to me in like 1982, something like that. 
So, I mean, he's right. There was no pollution on his farm. Not that there wasn't any in the world, but not on his farm. So, let's look at the minerals. I looked at the toxicants before and how they went up over the last 50, 60 years. So, if you look at the nutrients, the minerals, the good stuff, magnesium, if you, uh, and this is actually how they do it, they take samples from quite a number of different blood labs. So they say, okay, blood lab, uh, we want uh, half of your sample for everything you got today. We're testing magnesium. Test the magnesium, send us the results. Or on all the blood you're doing for the next week, we want you to add a magnesium, red blood cell magnesium test and send us the results. And that's how Center for Disease Control, Health Canada, et cetera, get these averages. So in the 1970s, it was 15 micrograms was the number that was average in magnesium in humans. 20 years later, it's half that, it's eight. 10 years after that, it's about half that again, it's down to five, and it's uh, a quarter of that today, 1.5 to two. So in the 1970, you come in for a magnesium test, which relates to your muscles, your heart, your muscular organs, uh, and they said, 15, you're normal. 2015, you go into the doctor for the same test, two, you're normal. 1970, two, you're sick. But today, it's normal. Sick is normal. Weak is normal. Toxic is normal. Low mineral is normal. And this is how they get these comparisons over the last number of decades. And they look at, so the I learned this because I go to medical conferences with environmental doctors and they say, don't go by the normal. Go by the 1970 standard. So if your patient has uh, two micrograms of magnesium in the red blood cell, they say, don't consider it normal, right? Consider it low, and you gotta boost them up. And if they're at 15, don't consider them unusually high, consider them healthy. So this is like the talk among the doctors who do this kind of stuff. These are the doctors. So when we first started marketing our product to medical doctors as an idea for them to sweat their patients better. We learned it from them in the first place, but there was very few. There might have been three doctors in all of North America who understood this when we started it 15 years ago. Um, and that would have been um, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine on the right at the top. To this day, if I go to their conferences, they're five years ahead of everybody else. If I go to any one of these other conferences, I'm like, oh, wow, you guys are learning about that now? I'm not even a doctor, right? So, but it's just because they're at the front end, they're the smartest, and they, their conferences work in an interesting way where um, they deliver case studies. So the one guy stands up and said, I had this patient, I had this problem, and then they deliver how they diagnosed it uh, over the next 20 to 30 minutes, and then they learn. And so that's probably why instead of just somebody getting up and lecturing, uh, they talk about how they do their job. The American College for the Advancement of Medicine is also looking into this stuff. The uh, Institute for Functional Medicine is a big one and it's growing. Uh, it's really good at marketing doctors and getting new people to come in to learn. And the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine is another one, but for my money, they're a little bit, you know, into plastic surgery plus healthy stuff, right? So that's kind of what that, what that group does. Um, and then the one that's the mother of all is this ISOM at the bottom. It's the International Society for Orthomolecular Medicine. Orthomolecular means the first molecule. So if you, if you or you know anybody who's sick, if you can find a doctor that is certified by any of these organizations, they're more likely to be able to cure them, less likely to be able to give them a pill, and more likely to be able to get to the point where they don't need the doctor anymore. So just in case somebody's looking at that, it's ACAM is one, AAEM is the other, A4M is the anti-aging, IFM is the Institute for Functional Medicine, and ISOM is the orthomolecular medicine. So what, here's they all practice the orthomolecular philosophy though, which is the first molecule. So they look at osteoporosis, they find there's low calcium absorption, and that's because there's high lead, because lead is absorbed into the body preferentially over calcium to get it out of the bloodstream. Remember I talked about how it only lasts a few weeks in the bloodstream and it goes somewhere? It doesn't go into space, it goes into your bone. So that's why you get osteoporosis and that's also why men are getting osteoporosis in their 40s and 50s now when they never used to get it at all. They die before their bones broke out. Women get the bones sucked out of them by their children building little rib cages and bones in their bellies. So typically, if you walk long enough on earth, you're gonna get osteoporosis, right? Because you got it sucked out of you when you were 20 and 30. But men, not so much, sorry, if I'm being too graphic, mom. <laughs> um, but so now, because of this 
high lead and going into the bones, everybody's getting it. Heart disease is another one. They can, they'll, they'll look at low magnesium absorption and there's high mercury. Mercury displaces magnesium in the intercellular tissue, preferentially over magnesium, to get it out of the way. The problem is it likes muscle tissue. So you get a little muscle cramping, you might be high in magnesium. Problem is your heart's a muscle and it goes into the heart and it can be responsible for cardiac arrest, congenital heart failure, all kinds of other diseases of the heart. If you sweat out the mercury, you can uh, then preferentially absorb enough magnesium out of your food that you don't need pills, supplements, anything else. So if you look at what I just talked about sweating out the mercury, here's four other minerals, or sorry, uh, toxicants, um, heavy metals. This study was done a few years ago, 2009, and the blue represents the level of, of heavy metal found in the sweat in parts per billion, and the yellow represents in the urine, I thought appropriately. Um, so you're looking at two and a half parts per billion measured in human urine, 25 aluminum in their sweat. If they can find five or 30, three parts per billion in our urine of lead, they can find 30 in our sweat, ounce for ounce. Yes? Uh, not particularly, no. There, there's there, there's a, maybe a slight difference. There's two types of sweat that come out, but the sweat is all good for you. And in this study, I don't believe they delineated between, they didn't differentiate rather between those two. Um, because some people exercised, some people used infrared sauna. And most of the doctors on this were my customers, so most of the, this was done by in, in a sauna unit. Um, not that we sponsored it, or I even knew they did it. Um, I only was sent the results one day. I kind of predicted it because um, they were all sitting around talking about it. And I said, you guys should just figure this out amongst yourselves. You're all like Dr. Wonks. You don't make enough money. You got nothing to do but figure it. And so the next thing they came, they, they sent me this, published in a peer-reviewed journal. So cadmium, this is a big one, okay? Nine parts per billion cadmium in our urine, okay? 90 in our sweat. This is enormous, okay? Because batteries and all this stuff, it gets in our... our um, our landfill sites and goes into our water table and these tiny amounts we're drinking it right you can sweat it out it's extraordinary I think this is one of the most important human discoveries that's been made in the 21st century humans sweat metal that's enormous but there's not a billion dollar pill at the end of that discovery so you didn't hear about it on the six o'clock news when I worked at CTV news I was shocked I was the most you know, eager young journalists, and I was shocked one day when they said, your story is the top story tonight, and you know, it probably means a lot of people died, but you know, you're, you're going to be the top guy in the news tonight, and I never felt happy about that because I was the one standing in the middle of the carcasses, but uh, the guys back in Toronto would be all like, this is a real shot in your arm. I never had any control over whether mine was the top story or not, so I never felt it as a badge of honor, but they would say it. So I would tune in, and I would go, okay, I would, let's see, it's the top story. And then Lloyd would say, a new drug was discovered in Toronto today, and it cures this, this, and this. And I thought, boy, that's the top story? I thought I had the top story. And then he goes on, and I'm thinking, that wasn't even a top, that doesn't even qualify as a top story, that was an ad. And then I found out the cost of getting your story on the CTV news ahead of the top of the news was $1 million for one shot. And they took it, and they paid it, and I'm serious. And if I was still working for them, I wouldn't be working for them anymore, if, they, if I said that at a room like this. But that's what happened. They do other stuff, like they do a little 30-second thing about money that turns out to be sponsored by the Royal Bank and that you don't know about on CTV, or they did then. I would imagine most of it's about phones and cell phone and how awesome wireless is now, because they're owned by Bell. But um, in fact, I know that because I know too much that I can't watch TV anymore. I watched an episode of Corner Gas that was entirely about wireless. And Brent going around going, is this wireless? And it was funny as hell. And he wanted to go camping, but the wireless. And I realized this is sponsored. This is like they got the same model as Seinfeld, where Schnapple would pay for an ad, and the New Yorker would pay for an ad, and they work it into a script. And CTV's owned by Bell, and here it was. And, then, and I was fighting Wi-Fi in my kid's school, and it just made me nuts. But Brent's still funny. Um, Anyway, so you can sweat out tons of stuff in your sweat that you can't urinate. It will not come out. We sweat plastic. Phthalates and bisphenol A were present in human sweat and metabolites when they couldn't even detect them in urine. So non-detect at five parts per billion, it shows zero. It might be four, but if the test's only looking for five at the lowest level, it shows zero, and they were getting above that in the sweat. So this is incredible. 
those estrogenic mimics that cause prostate cancer and breast cancer and thyroid disruption and autoimmune disorders can be sweated out on a daily basis. And it's the only way to get them out. How simple is that? So the recent studies in sweat toxicity, and these ones haven't been reported yet. I just happen to know these doctors and I go to the medical conferences where they lecture at all those ones I showed you, and they'll lecture them about before they publish them because there'll be questions from the floor, like my friend just asked here about the two types of sweat, and they'll think about it and they'll, they'll refine it and then they'll go and write it. And then the, this takes half a decade sometimes to get a paper like this out. And, and then, it, of course, it comes back from peer review and it gets rewritten and it goes out. That's why once it gets published, it's bloody ironclad. But what they're talking about now is that Roundup is, available, is, is measurable in human sweat and breast milk. We know that as well. Brominated fire retardant, that thing I talked about, it's in all the mattresses and the, uh, and the sofas and all that stuff that's in us, that's carcinogenic, is sweated out. This is phenomenal because this stuff is in your dust bunnies in your corners. You're inhaling it in this room as we speak, okay? And you can sweat it out. You can get it out of you. So the small amount we're inhaling is obviously not knocking us out. It's not even making us tired. But do that for 20 years and something might fall out of whack. That little tiny 0.05 of a percent might fall out of whack. But you can sweat this stuff out. And this is an extraordinary discovery. We knew saunas were making you better, but these guys have taken it down to the scientific level of measuring the sweat. This is a really big study. This one came out of Finland where more than 80% of the population is in a sauna a lot. So you can do studies like this. So it was a 20 year study with thousands of men. All these men, I don't know, only men. And uh, using a study, for, a sauna four to seven times a week, so that's a lot. Um, even myself, three to four times a week would be good. Um, a 66% reduction in the risk of adult onset dementia or Alzheimer's. That's extraordinary. Go to the old folks' home and see how bad you want dementia. I hang out there. My dad lives in one. He's awesome. He's having the time of his life. But a lot of people standing in the chair catatonic aren't. And if he can get through to his last days without staring at a blank wall, that would be awesome. And, but again, he's one of these guys born in the 30s, lived on the farm. He had a better start, a way head start on all of us. You know? We live in a toxic city. What can you do? They all are, but we're in the biggest one in Canada and the third largest in North America outside of Mexico. The same study, oops, I went the wrong way, showed that heart disease on the same group of people was dramatically reduced, like 30, 40, 50 percent, by the people who used the sauna. And the more they used it, they were in the lower group. So the ones who used it four times a week, had a they were like 30, 31 percent less likely. The ones who used it seven times were 38 percent less likely. Um, so they were, and this is reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, not exactly a fringe publication. Okay, this is the rock hard mainstream. It's probably owned by the pharmaceutical companies if it's the American Medical Association, but they're reporting on it. So sweat, sweat, sweat. First, last, and always sweat. Uh, this, uh, 2006 was the first study that we sponsored where we looked at six to 12 months of sweating for an hour, five times a week. And it was reported by Dr. Satdaram Kaur, who's a legendary naturopathic doctor in Canada and known throughout North America for her multiple books about breast cancer and women's health. And she showed that um, it, it lowered the amount of lead, mercury, DDT, and PCBs in your urinalysis. So back then we were only doing urinalysis. We didn't know, but the sweat analysis wasn't developed yet. But all this stuff went down. So we measured them at the beginning and then after uh, six to 12 months and it all went down. The solution to revert back to my grandfather's age a hundred years ago is to sweat. Every day if you can, if it knocks you out, take a day off in between. Go three days, one day off. But if you're sweating every day, it's not just about the accumulated toxins that you've had your whole life. It's about drinking from that styrofoam coffee cup. I mean, you try to avoid, but you can't always, you know? Uh, and you know even the organic butter is going to have DDT in it because that stuff's in the rain. Never mind they didn't feed them pesticides. Awesome. Well, human or bovine growth hormone, all that stuff's great. But this is environmental toxin that, you know, you've got 100,000 cars running through the streets of Toronto, you're breathing some benzene in every day, right? So you've got to get it out every day. The results, we have seen personally as well as medically documented 
asthma reversed 100% in largest, in, in, I would say, let's say 90 to 100%. Maybe they still have an attack if they go in a hot temperature sauna or if they, you know, rub their face in a bunch of cats or go to the Immune Society, something, but mostly the triggers are gone for, for asthma. Diabetes has been reversed so many times. We've had people coming to us for years. We haven't even said it out loud because we didn't know why. They were saying, I, got my, I don't have to wear glasses anymore. I got my driver's license back. I don't need insulin shots anymore. What is it about this sauna? And I've heard it time and again and again and again. And then I went to the first lecture where Dr. Jenis was giving the results of what he found in human sweat, and he had a list. And then I went to another lecture on type 2 diabetes toxic causes, and he had a list. And there were a lot of cross connections in those lists. And I went, okay, now I've got Everybody who's had diabetes who uses my sauna tells me they, get, they reverse it to some degree or entirely and I now know that these toxins can be sweated out and these toxins are, are definitely associated with diabetes, we can say it. It's because diabetes is not a genetic failure of the pancreas. It is a toxic accumulation in your organs that cause the pancreas to underperform. And if you remove the toxins, it can revert to full function, to homeostasis. Fibromyalgia, this new disease that is basically a collection of symptoms nobody understands, can be seriously alleviated in the sauna. Psoriasis can be reversed. So you can have head to toe psoriasis, and I've seen it, and we've got before and after, and there's been, Suzanne Summers did a documentary about our uh, uh, customers reversing psoriasis. This poor woman, she came into my factory with her husband and her one-year-old child and she said I, the, the, the psoriasis kicked in when she got pregnant. She had the baby, it never left. She's, she's a school teacher, she's about to go off her maternity and start on Labor Day and she says I can't put clothes on. She was wearing a bikini. She's in my factory with her husband and her daughter. She says I can't wear clothes. So I told her that we'd had a lot of success with psoriasis. Off they went with the sauna. Two weeks later her husband phoned me back and said you basically saved her job, my life, our marriage. I haven't touched the woman since she got this psoriasis. There was a photograph they showed me where he's, they're doing a family thing at an event. He's got his arm around her. He's got the baby, and they're all smiling. And he says, look at my hand. And it's this far from her body. He's faking to hold her because he couldn't literally touch the woman. She was like, her skin was like, like uh, brittle paper. Two weeks, gone. She had a little spot on her wrist. That was it. And that's when the film crew called us and said, have you got anything that's really obvious? I said, yeah, I got one that's really obvious. And this is psoriasis all the time. We get these people phoning me from Calgary. You won't pull this sauna from my cold, dead hands, he said. Sounds like he's from the NRA. Uh, because his whole life of discomfort was gone. Arthritis, same thing. People report relief in five minutes. Permanent relief in two weeks. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome. You'd think being in a sauna is going to knock you out, but it energizes you and when you, <clears throat> when you sweat out those particles, remember I said about the mitochondria, those little building blocks of energy, you get more energy. High blood pressure becomes normalized, low blood very quickly because there's a calming effect, but uh, low blood pressure normalizes as well through the detoxification process. So all of this stuff that I talked about, it's the scourge of the human population that's all going way, way up, you can control it. You can just sweat. And you don't have to be in an infrared sauna that's awesome from sauna ray. You can have, maybe there's one in your building, right? There are risks associated with a high temperature sauna. Don't overheat yourself. Don't get knocked out. You can overheat your core. Toxins flush into the bloodstream. You can have a reaction. You can get faint. But, you know, if you have, like I go, in, sometimes in hotels I have a sauna in the morning. I just go down when there's nobody else there and I turn it off and I open the door. And then maybe I shower, get ready, something like that. So I'm cooling it down for my own, you know, taste. But, um, it's that high temperature that causes the side effects. In the infrared saunas that we build, you get all of the benefit and none of the side effects because you're going in below your core body temperature. And that's why I think this is a piece of 21st century furniture that should be in every home like it is in those fins because you can't rent an apartment in Finland without a sauna in it already, like a washer or dryer would be in one in, 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 in Toronto. You'll have a sauna. They're in every house. So these, what we build is non-toxic. Saunas never used to be toxic, but when they started coming in from China, made of plywood and carbon fiber and plastic, they're making people sicker. 
We make them in Canada so we control 100% of the process. We log the trees ourselves. We make the heaters ourselves. We do all the wiring ourselves and we put a lifetime warranty because it's so well built. We build it without glue. We did that by going to antique furniture stores and looking at how any tables that were made pre-1920, pre-chemical revolution, we looked at how they were built and we built them that way because they're still standing there being sold as antiques. They're solid as a rock. They can, if that can work for 100 years, this can work for 100 years. We don't use any plastics. We don't use the carbon fiber, as I mentioned. Not even a lacquer on the outside. We hand finish it in beeswax. We go back to the old methods, pre-pollution methods, to build our little sanctuary so that you can get better without getting sicker. And one of the biggest things we do is we make it so you can sweat without raising your core temperature. So you go in, instead of at 60 degrees in those high temp saunas, you go in at 25. So I'm already 38 inside. So if I'm breathing 25, that's not bugging me. And as it goes up 30, 35, it's going to start to feel hot, but it's still not bugging me. It's not affecting my heart rate, my blood pressure, or my blood temperature. You get a good sweat on, by the time it crosses 38, that's your cooling mechanism that you described, kicking in. So you can now be breathing 40 degrees, and you're still not going to raise your blood temperature because you're cool, you're cooling. The sweat's coming out. So you get all of that detoxification, none of the side effect of the high temperature. All of the stuff that we talked about comes out, you wipe it off in a towel, and off it goes to the laundry. And this is what we've been doing now for close to 15 years. And we've now served probably 3,500 people worldwide with these saunas. We're now shipping them because it's unique what we build. We do this little thing at a niche company in Collingwood, Ontario, that no one else in the world is doing. And I got a lot of high flyer friends up there. There's a lot of money up in Collingwood. They say, oh, you're going to take this global. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. I said, it already, that already exists. Because as soon as you do that, you have to go mass production. And then the way we build it doesn't make sense. Like this is like Santa's workshop. There's guys with mallets putting wood together, right? An efficiency expert would come in and lose his mind looking at the place. So we build this thing by hand because it needs to be built. And I'm selling it to doctor's offices in South Africa, South America. We're in, uh, there was a customer here from Peru saying, hey, where's my sauna? I'm going to be back in Peru in a month. Uh, we're shipping it down to her. We've got them throughout the Middle East. There's a cancer doctor in Beersheba in Israel who prescribes them to many of his patients. Um, we've got them throughout Europe, Hawaii, Alaska. We ship them all over because they find us, normally through the medical conferences, also conferences like this. We don't go to a lot of, of public conferences. We go to this one because it's close to home and we have a very learned audience so um, people understand. You know, you, you guys have a high level of health education already when you walk in the door. Um, but we're going to continue to do it the way we do it because it's the right way. And if we didn't do it, no one else would do it. We were approached by a very large company to buy our company about five years ago. And boy, you start thinking, <laughs> like, you know, how many million are we going to get, honey? And then uh, it kind of fizzled. And we thought, you know what? If, we, if that had gone through, it wouldn't have been a sonnery. I almost wouldn't have wanted my brand on it. It's like my name because we build it with care and with love and with purity. It'll never break down. We put a lifetime warranty on it. And if you haven't tried one, I encourage you to come upstairs to the booth and go in. They're on. You can try them out. They're very gentle. Everybody who sits in smiles relaxed immediately. It's like nothing you've ever felt. So uh, I thank you for listening today. I hope you've learned something. I hope I was able to impart some of the information that I gather along the way. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer if I can. Yes? Yes. So, do you take immediately That's a very good question. If you didn't hear it, she's saying there's good stuff that you sweat out too. The minerals, potassium, magnesium, calcium, sodium. These are your energy minerals. These are the little electrolytes that cause electrical reaction in your body. So when you lose those, you'll, you become really weak really fast. So we actually supply every customer with a little free jar of it. And then we sell it in a one pound jar. And it's not cheap. It's about 80 bucks, but we include shipping for a one pound jar. And it's a super high grade. So we have it compounded by a small compounder. We work with a lot of little companies that are like us. If they weren't doing it, nobody would. So it's a Canadian company, and they make it for us. And it's got a high level of magnesium, potassium, sodium, and calcium. And so we do supply it. And it is critical. You drink it before and you drink it afterward to keep your energy up. For the length of time, I didn't actually address that, so it's a good question. Our sauna, 
Um, I usually say 30 minutes is an average. Somebody might go a few more, a few less. Depends on you. We put a functional window in every door, so if you start feeling too hot, you can crack the window open as much as you want and reduce the air temperature in your face. That keeps your core temperature normalized while you continue to sweat. Yes? Oh, sorry, hands, Paul. He's Yeah, you do. We ha it's a very high concentration that we have. It's not for, and it's, it's, it's for a, um, rehydration from acute dehydration. So we have, it's, it's half a gram of potassium and another half gram of calcium and again uh, sodium and again um, um, magnesium. And the rest of the spectrum, there are trace minerals in it, but um, this is enough to get you boosted back up. We also recommend psyllium husk because it mops up the toxins in your gut. We don't sell it because it's commonly available. H high grade um, uh, electrolyte restoration like we make is unavailable anywhere else. Partly because the potassium calcium ratio is, does not um, fit the Health Canada standards. You have to have way less potassium and that's important for that balance um, as a nutritional daily supplement. But in our opinion you're depleting so much that you have to rehydrate it. So we can't sell it commonly. By law, we're allowed to supply it to our customers with, uh, you know, uh, because it's specifically for this. But we have medical doctors buy it from us from by the case. Well, the majority, that's hard to say. So what you're talking about is like a bioaccumulated, uh, so you're talking about months here, years, or, or, on the, or on the, during the session? When the, when the, when the lion's share of whatever was in you is going to be It's going to be symptomatic. You're going to start feeling more energetic. Whatever symptom you had is going to be gone. But you're going to be getting, so then you can reduce, like you can just go once a week after that to get rid of whatever you, you know, inhaled, drank, or ate that week. Hans Paul. Yes. We use basswood in all of our saunas because when we were selecting the sauna to be toxin free, no glue, no plastic, no carbon fiber, we looked at, well, what's the wood? Wood is aromatic. Some people are allergic to wood. Cedar is the most allergenic wood in North America. 35% of the human population is naturally sensitive to it. So we went with basswood because it's on the opposite end of the spectrum. Nobody's allergic to it. Maybe somebody, but if they are, they'll know it. But really, they use it for tongue depressors because you can put it in the mouth and have no reaction. They use it for pizza spatulas and cheese boxes because it's approved as a food grade wood. So it's a lot thicker than any of those things I described because we actually log the trees ourselves within about 100 miles of our factory. We have them kiln dried and shaped into the tongue and groove all on the same property and then shrink wrapped and brought to our sauna facility. So we go to that trouble because our patients are people like who come here or sorry our customers. They're patients of doctors who trust us to do it the way we say. So if I go and buy a bunch of basswood off the market, maybe that just came in a truck with a new delivery of plywood, with a new delivery of MDF fiberboard or, or, or uh, creosote coated deck wood and somebody's going to get sick from it because they're going to be sensitive to a minute amount. So we basically make it so like you're cutting the tree down in your backyard yourself. So it goes back to uh, our philosophy of purity. Uh, in the very back? Yes. I don't know. Uh, that's the first time I've been asked that question. I believe that the studies that I showed you are for prevention, meaning the fewer of them acquire dementia over time. Theoretically, if the dementia is not a bacterial agent like Lyme, which it can do that, it does do that, uh, if it's a toxic related lead, aluminum would be the two that it would be most likely. So if you got a person who had dementia, if you had them tested at a naturopath for their metals and anything else, plasticide, any of the stuff I've talked about, and look if there was an outlier in any of it, then maybe it's worth a try. Yeah. Like when an outlier, I mean everything's a little bit elevated and one of them's up through the roof. And then you go, bingo, that's maybe what's good. So that's what the doctors would do. They'd go, that's what I, I don't know if it is, but that's what I'm going to focus on, bringing that number down. And then, look at what happens. 
Sorry, there was just somebody at the back first. Yeah, that's you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what you're doing is as you're sweating, you're wiping it off. And we have protocols that we give to everybody who buys a sauna from us. That, am I done? Are we wrapping? Am I getting the, the hook? You don't? No? You? you? She just happens to be standing there. She doesn't even work here. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone know what time it is? Oh, we've got a few minutes left. Okay. So what we recommend is that you're sitting on towels all over the place, so uh, you're sweating into the towel. And then as the sweat comes, even if just a little bit, you start wiping it off and you wipe it off as it comes. And the key is, at the end, it's really coming. Like once it's coming out of your forearms, the back of your forearms, and your kneecap area, that's a really good detoxifying sweat, because those areas sweat late. So then the trick is to get out of there without that reabsorption. Not that it's terrible, it was in you five seconds ago, so you're not gonna die from it, but you're trying to maximize, right? So what I normally do is I open the window, I start to cool down, because the second you, you expose yourself to room temperature air, it goes back in, right? It's like in a second, yeah. So you just, you wipe off a little bit, I kick the door open, I wipe off more, I, I walk out, I, I wet some more sweat, and I wipe off more, so, I mean, that's, that's just me. But um, if it was in you five seconds ago, it's not gonna kill you if you reabsorb a little bit. But you'd be wiping it off as it comes. The idea is not to, to get as much sweat on you as you can, it's to be wiping it off constantly. And it encourages more sweat, too. That you will, so you have to sit on towels. Yeah. Who had a question? No, we have multiple sizes, even upstairs we have multiple sizes, so we have a little bit smaller. This is, you know, probably the most common because it's the biggest one that still plugs into a regular 110 outlet. So, uh, but we have bigger ones that need a 220, we have a smaller one that can go in a condo or an apartment. Yes? Yeah. Well, there would be no difference. Um, Yeah, so uh, you'll hear a lot about that. Um, so it's kind of complex. Anything imported from China, for, don't, don't get it. First of all, they're lying on their website. So they've said no EMF, okay, which is impossible, unless it's fired by wood, okay? Then it's, you know, then it's no EMF, right? So if it's, um, these carbon fiber ones operate on a 12 volt system, and they have to step down the current from 240 volts to 12 volts, and they've got all kinds of you know, interruptions in the electrical circuit, and that's where you get the EMF problem. Um, the near-infrared versus far-infrared is what's being emitted off of it. So the dangerous form of EMF, that low frequency, uh, 50, 60 hertz, is not impacted by that. There's a lot of websites out there that don't know what they're talking about. Uh, they've probably read our website and tried to translate it. Um, the EMF comes from the electrical wiring in it. So the near, mid, and far infrared are emitted from all infrared heaters because the difference between a near, a mid, and a far infrared range is like between four and nine microns. So the, di the distance of the crest and the trough of the wave in a near infrared wave is three microns, teeny, teeny, teeny. The mid infrared is five to seven. So that's almost the same. And then the far infrared goes from uh, eight to like a thousand. Like, so it's, it's out there. So it, the near is almost red. So when you're looking at the colors of the rainbow, it's almost red hot. The mid is just a little bit off that, it's just a little bit off that. So the sweet spot is very narrow in there. But that doesn't affect the EMF. The EMF is affected by bad electrical wiring or imported wiring from China and they're not making it to the North American electrical standard. So there's a bunch of transformers and step downs and stuff like that that, that cause that problem. Yeah. Sir. Time. Well, I have one last question from this nice lady here, I think. Oh, did you have a question? You know what, why don't, if you want to ask, come up to the booth right now. So we're just, if you just go inside, hang a sharp right in the Sonoray booth right there. But thank you all very much for coming, I appreciate it.